Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Minahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey folks, today we're going to take a look at Don't Turn Your Back from Evil Hat Productions. Now, this game is based off of an RPG, which to be honest, I had never heard of before I played Don't Turn Your Back. It was called Don't Rest Your Head uh, from Evil Hat Productions, which primarily makes RPGs, so that makes sense. Um, I'm going to be honest here as well, I'm a little confused on the story. I tried to piece together what I can from web excerpts that I read, but basically uh, it supposedly takes place in a version of our world, but where if people become insomniacs or they don't sleep uh, for a long period of time, their mind starts to fray and they sort of bleed into this other world called the Mad City, which is full of like these phantasmagoric horrors and uh, weird things. It kind of reminds me of um, Neil Gaiman's uh, Neverwhere a little bit, but a little bit darker than that. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm at with it. I, I I know a little bit about it, but not a ton. But in any case, you and the other players are people who have fallen into this uh, mad city, and you are trying to uh, gather the favors of the denizens of this city in order to court influence in the form of candles. Um, all of these things are like very um, allegorical. They represent other things. <laughs> lots of stuff like that. Now, the main mechanisms of the game are deck building primarily, but also worker placement, believe it or not. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at how the game actually works, theme aside. Then we're going to come back, I'll let you know what I think. In Don't Turn Your Back, each player is a denizen of the Mad City that is trying to gain the most influence and prestige in the form of candles, aka victory points, that are counted on the candle tally. Whoever has the most candles at the end of 8 or 9 rounds of play, depending on the number of players, is the winner of the game. Rounds are kept track of via law cards. You'll always use the first admonishment card as your first, but the other 7 or 8 cards are randomized and put face down on the board. Law cards are like achievements so players can dedicate themselves to or ignore to gain more candles. More on that later. Each player starts off with a particular character from the Mad City and takes a player board which has flavor text on one side and spots for her cards on the other. Speaking of that, each player gets a set of 8 starter favor cards and a stack of acquisition cards. The starter favor cards get shuffled together to form her starting deck, which she then draws 4 cards from. The acquisition deck consists of cards that the player doesn't own yet, but she can purchase them later, making them, in, uh, making them into favor cards for her deck. They get shuffled together, with 6 cards flipped up to buy later. It's important to note that every player has the exact same deck and starting cards. They just have different colored borders. After this, standard deck building game rules apply. When you purchase cards, they go into your favor discard pile. Every round, at the end, you will draw back up to four from your deck, and if you don't have enough to do so, you'll have to reshuffle your discard pile, and therefore eventually draw and be able to play those shiny new cards. Each card you use in the game has several areas of note. Cards you can purchase, meaning not starter cards, have a cost up in the top right corner. In the top left corner of the card is its pain score. Pain is a resource that you'll use in the different areas of the Mad City, and usually the more the better. You might be vying for dominance to get candles, or converting it to influence to buy your cards. Where you can place this card to use its pain is determined by the city indicators on the left side, which will have two letter abbreviations and colors signifying legal places in the city to play. Some cards have bizarre effects, meaning that they have special abilities when they are placed in the bazaar specifically. These might be ongoing beneficial effects for you, special one-time effects, attacks, or defenses against those attacks. Every round of the game is broken down into four phases. In the first phase, players take turns placing cards from their hand into appropriate spaces on the board, in a mechanism akin to worker placement. This keeps going until everyone runs out of cards, runs out of legal spaces, which is dependent on the number of players, or chooses to pass. Phase two is when you tally the influence that you acquired from pain to buy cards. Phase 3 is distributing points based on how everyone scored in the city, and Phase 4 is the cleanup phase, where cards are placed into the Wax Kingdom and players redraw their hands. Now what does all of that mean? Well, there are 5 parts of the city. In the high school, you're trying to have the most total pain amongst cards that you've played there. You start placing cards from the left start position. Whoever has the most pain during the scoring phase will get one candle per point of pain while the others will get one candle per card that they've played. 
After scoring, cards are removed equal to the number of cards of the player who played the most cards. The rest of the cards, if there are any, stay until the next round. The city slumbering is how you purchase cards for your acquisition lineup. For every card that you play, you will total up the pain in phase two, and that becomes influence to let you buy cards. When you buy cards from your acquisition row, you can buy as many cards as you can afford and then go into your discard pile, then get replaced with new cards from the top of your acquisition deck. The Bizarre Bizarre is where cards go to activate their Bizarre abilities, as mentioned before. Most cards will take effect immediately, while some will linger until used. Either way, they take up space until the end of the round, so space is still finite. District 13 has to do with the Law cards that we mentioned before. Cards played are strictly for influencing the current law, and trying to meet its requirements to get more points. The Wax Kingdom is a pivotal endgame area. Cards placed here are excised from your deck permanently until the end of the game. They will get wiped away into the encased pile at the end of the round. At the end of the game, every encased card is tallied, and players score points depending on how much pain was encased. First place gets to score points gets to score points based on the total cost of her encased cards, while second place scores points based on her total pain, and so on. So, players will take turns playing to all of these areas and scoring their effects sooner or later. They'll do this for 8 or 9 rounds, depending on the number of players, and that's essentially the game. Let's get to my final thoughts. Overall, Don't Turn Your Back has a lot of really interesting things going on, and dare I say innovative in the way that all of these disparate elements that we've seen before blend together... But there's a few hiccups in the game that really hampered my enjoyment of it. Let's go ahead and start with the components. Uh, now, component-wise, like actual physical components, I guess the board is fine. The rule book is okay. It's kind of walls of text, but I'm, I can get over that pretty easily. The card stock is okay. Things like that. The pawns that you use for um, keeping track of your points, while it's only for keeping track of your points and really who cares at a certain point, they are so cheap and dinty looking, if that's a word. Um, they look like something from the Game Crafter, and I think that's where they probably are from. Um, <laughs> I don't. I think I would have preferred cardboard tokens, to be honest. But otherwise, I can't complain about the physical quality too much. The artwork is very subjective. Now, I think that it's not bad artwork. I mean, in the sense that it's high quality, it's well done. I mean, I've bashed other games' artwork for just looking incredibly cheap and amateurish and not up to the quality of a professional board game. I don't think that's the case here, but it's definitely not for me. It, um, It's incredibly dark to the point where I can't even make out what's in the picture on most of these, which I guess is what they were going for. But while some of them look okay, where like there's like this kind of like bloody goth shit coming out, and I'm like, okay, it's not really my style, but I can see it. Others are just kind of silly, where it's like, oh, there's the tax, and it's a guy with a tack for a head, and there's Pinhead, and there's got a pin for a head, and the truant officer just has an ant or a, some sort of praying mantis head. Okay, <laughs> it really looks like some sort of hot topic fever dream. Um, so not my style, but again, eh, it's kind of um, up to subjective opinion. Although I will say that a lot of times it kind of hampers the actual gameplay because it's like, again, trying to figure out what on the board which kind of carries over that style. It's just kind of weird and the, the text on the board. Things like that, sort of superficial things. Now on to the gameplay, which I said was very interesting, and I stand by that. The idea of deck building, first off, I love deck building as a game mechanism, and I like worker placement too. That's probably, it might actually be in my top five um, game mechanisms, and no, I'm not going to do a top ten list on that. Uh, <laughs> so the marriage of those two should excite me, and I think that for the most part, it's handled in a very interesting and good way um, in Don't uh, Turn Your Back, where I keep wanting to say Don't Rest Your Head, Don't Turn Your Back, whatever. Uh, where you're competing over these different areas. One area of the bazaar actually activates special abilities. One of the areas is specifically like you're doing worker placement in order to buy cards to put into your deck. Those areas are interesting. Um, the problems arise in areas like the District 13 and the Wax Kingdom. The Wax Kingdom is so obtuse. I mean, it's, once you get through it the first time, you're like, okay, that's how the scoring works. But it's such an obtuse, long-term strategy thing, so at odds with the rest of the game, that it really just feels awkward. It sits out, it sticks out like a sore thumb. And it's the main way for you to get rid of cards as well. So that's an awkward thing too. District 13, where you're competing over the different laws, this was incredibly uneven. Sometimes 
sometimes those laws are very important. People are competing for them fiercely, trying to get those points. Other times, people are just like, eh, <laughs> I can get points elsewhere. Who cares? People ignore it. Some people do. Some people don't. If you get blocked out from doing it simply because of turn order, well, there's nothing you can do anyways. So that's another awkward thing. Because someone could say, okay, well, I really need to go here to get points. And it gets back around to you. And you may not just have a card that lets you play in a certain part of the city. In some parts of the city, that can be rough, but not too rough. But for District 13, it could just be you saying, well, I just got screwed out of a bunch of points. I guess I'll just focus my energy elsewhere. So I actually would have been happier if the law deck was just, hey, flip over a card. This happens to everybody. And we keep track of the rounds. Because it really doesn't have that much of a game effect and it just feels kind of awkward. The Bazaar is an interesting idea. It's kind of the idea of how in a deck building game where you have limited actions, this is how you keep track of it in this game. So I'm kind of okay with that. Uh, but this is definitely a, a rich gets richer game. In the sense that, especially in the high school, where someone can play cards down there, get... Um, a lot of pain and therefore get a ton of points just because, again, they got lucky and had the really high pain cards in their hand. Furthermore, if you were lucky enough to have cards stay over from the previous round, not only do you already have an edge in the category of pain, but having more cards, you, you can have like control of the flow of cards and how they stay in there. And if you carry cards over from round to round, if you're like the last person to play a card, it's less likely your cards are going to get wiped out. Therefore, you're going to get more and more and more and more candles. Overall, point disparities in this game are huge. There's no close games, at least of, that I've played, of don't turn your back. It's always, yeah, these people are clustered up together. The first player is way up front, 20 points ahead. And it's because of things like that with the high school but also the Wax Kingdom as well. Again, turn order has to do with it. Who gets to draw their cards actually to apply to this part of the city that they want to play to? These can, things can be kind of rough. One of the big issues I have with the game, though, as well, is that, <laughs> speaking of luck, every player has the exact same deck of cards. Now, that's problematic in and of itself. I would have at least, at least liked something to be different. Your starter cards to be different. Maybe each player has a different special ability so your cards are all the same, but how you can manipulate them would be different. That would have been nice. As it is, they're just different colors, so you could differentiate them when they get put into piles, like in the encased pile. Um, but with that ability... Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but uh, the fact that everyone is the same means that... Th th now I remember uh, what I was getting to. What it comes down to is who's going to get their clutch cards out at a time when they can afford them first. If someone just so happens to get the right amount of pain to put into the city slumbering in order to buy a really awesome card, and there are clearly some cards that are better than other cards as far as like how pain goes, their bizarre abilities, and their attack abilities, and so on. If they're able to get those cards before the other players do, again, it's that runaway leader snowball problem. I can use this card almost every other round, depending on how many cards I have in my deck, and you guys haven't even bought it yet. It hasn't even come up in your acquisition lineup yet because of luck. So I'm not unused to luck in deck building games, but it feels more pronounced here. And ultimately, I think the game is just kind of anticlimactic. Again, when the game has this sort of runaway leader problem, and when you're doing the same things every round and the laws don't really apply too much, cards carry over from round to round, it starts to feel like there's not a lot of excitement in the game, despite the fact that the theme and what you're doing should be exciting. I don't want to say the game is a terrible game. I think there's a lot of interesting ideas here. It does feel like the game was not developed quite enough. Uh, it's pure speculation on my part. I don't want to throw on the accusation of it not being play tested enough or whatnot. But it seems like there was an emphasis placed on the theme, which is so somewhat there, going around to different parts of the city, and really placed on the, hey, deck building with work replacement. Awesome idea. But it needs to be refined more. I would love to see another edition of this game that sort of worked out those kind of kinks, felt smoother, felt a better transition, really emphasized the best elements of the game, but got away with the rest of them. So that's Don't Turn Your Back from Evil Hat Productions. Almost there, not quite, can't recommend it. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.